Section 5 of Manners, Customs, and Dress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Stewart. Manners, Customs, and Dress During the Middle Ages and During the Renaissance Period by Paul de Croix. Section 5 private life in the castles, the towns, and the rural districts, the Merovingian castles, pastimes of the nobles, hunting, war, domestic arrangements, private life of Charlemagne, domestic habits under the Carlovingians, influence of chivalry, simplicity of the court of Philip Augustus not imitated by his successors, princely life of the fifteenth century, the bringing up of Latour Landry, a noble of Anjou, varlets, pages, esquires, maids of honor, opulence of the bourgeoisie, le ménagier de Paris, ancient dwellings, state of rustics at various periods, rustic sayings by Noël du Fayle, Augustin Thierry, taking Gregory of Tours, the Merovingian Herodotus, as an authority, thus describes a royal domain under the first royal dynasty of france this dwelling in no way possessed the military aspect of the chateau of the middle ages it was a large building surrounded with porticoes of roman architecture sometimes built of carefully polished and sculptured wood which in no way was wanting in elegance around the main body of the building were arranged the dwellings of the officers of the palace either foreigners or romans and those of the chiefs of companies who according to germanic custom had placed themselves and their warriors under the king that is to say under a special engagement of vassalage and fidelity other houses of less imposing appearance were occupied by a great number of families who worked at all sorts of trades such as jewelry the making of arms weaving currying the embroidering of silk and gold cotton etc farm buildings paddocks cowhouses sheepfolds barns the houses of agriculturalists and the cabins of the serfs completed the royal village which perfectly resembled although on a larger scale the villages of ancient germany there was something too in the position of these dwellings which resembled the scenery beyond the rhine the greater number of them were on the borders and some few in the centre of great forests which have since been partly destroyed and the remains of which we so much admire although historical documents are not very explicit respecting those remote times it is only sufficient to study carefully a very small portion of the territory in order to form some idea of the manners and customs of the franks for in the royal domain we find the existence of all classes from the sovereign himself down to the humblest slave as regards the private life however of the different classes in this elementary form of society we have but approximate and very imperfect notions it is clear however that as early as the beginning of the merovingian race there was much more luxury and comfort among the upper classes than is generally supposed all the gold and silver furniture all the jewels all the rich stuffs which the gallo-romans had amassed in their sumptuous dwellings had not been destroyed by the barbarians the frank kings had appropriated the greater part and the rest had fallen into the hands of the chiefs of companies in the division of spoil a well-known anecdote namely that concerning the vase of soissons which king clovis wished to preserve and which a soldier broke with an axe proves that many gems of ancient art must have disappeared owing to the ignorance and brutality of the conquerors although it is equally certain that the latter soon adopted the tastes and customs of the native population at first they appropriated everything that flattered their pride and sensuality this is how the material remains of the civilization of the gauls were preserved in the royal and noble residences the churches and the monasteries gregory of tours informs us that when fredegonda wife of Shilperic, gave the hand of her daughter regutha to the son of the gothic king 
fifty chariots were required to carry away all the valuable objects which composed the princess's dower a strange family scene related by the same historian gives us an idea of the private habits of the court of that terrible queen of the franks the mother and daughter had frequent quarrels which sometimes ended in the most violent encounters fredegonda said one day to ragutha why do you continually trouble me here are the goods of your father take them and do as you like with them and conducting her to a room where she locked up her treasures she opened a large box filled with valuables after having pulled out a great number of jewels which she gave to her daughter she said i am tired put your own hands in the box and take what you find ragutha bent down to reach the objects placed at the bottom of the box upon which fredegonda immediately lowered the lid on her daughter and pressed upon it with so much force that the eyes began to start out of the princess's head a maid began screaming help my mistress is being murdered by her mother and ragutha was saved from an untimely end it is further related that this was only one of the minor crimes attributed by history to fredegonda the terrible who always carried a dagger or poison about with her amongst the franks as amongst all barbaric populations hunting was the pastime preferred when war was not being waged the merovingian nobles were therefore determined hunters and it frequently happened that hunting occupied whole weeks and took them far from their homes and families but when the season or other circumstances prevented them from waging war against men or beasts they only cared for feasting and gambling to these occasions they gave themselves up with a determination and wildness well worthy of those semi-civilized times it was the custom for invited guests to appear armed at the feasts which were the more frequent inasmuch as they were necessarily accompanied with religious ceremonies it often happened that these long repasts followed by games of chance were stained with blood either in private quarrels or in a general melee one can easily imagine the tumult which must have arisen in a numerous assembly when the hot wine and other fermented drinks such as beer etc had excited every one to the highest pitch of unchecked merriment some of the merovingian kings listened to the advice of the ministers of the catholic religion and tried to reform these noisy excesses and themselves abandoned the evil custom for this purpose they received at their tables bishops who blessed the assembly at the commencement of the meal and were charged besides to recite chapters of holy writ or to sing hymns out of the divine service so as to edify and occupy the minds of the guests gregory of tours bears witness to the happy influence of the presence of bishops at the tables of the frank kings and nobles he relates too that Shilperic, who was very proud of his theological and secular knowledge liked when dining to discuss or rather to pronounce authoritatively his opinion on questions of grammar before his companions in arms who for the most part neither knew how to read nor write he even went as far as to order three ancient greek letters to be added to the latin alphabet the private properties of the frank kings were immense and produced enormous revenues these monarchs had palaces in almost all the large towns at bourges chalon sur saone chalon sur marne dijon etampes metz langres mayence reims soissons tours toulouse treves valenciennes vamps etc in paris they occupied the vast residence now known as the terme de julien hotel de cluny which then extended from the hill of st genevieve as far as the seine but they frequently left it for their numerous villas in the neighbourhood on which occasions they were always accompanied by their treasury all these residences were built on the same plan high walls surrounded the palace the roman atrium preserved under the name of pro aulium pro anticourt 
was placed in front of the salutorium hall of reception where visitors were received the consistorium or great circular hall surrounded with seats served for legislation councils public assemblies and other solemnities at which the kings displayed their royal pomp the tricorium or dining-room was generally the largest hall in the palace two rows of columns divided it into three parts one for the royal family one for the officers of the household and the third for the guests who were always very numerous no person of rank visiting the king could leave without sitting at his table or at least draining a cup to his health the king's hospitality was magnificent especially on great religious festivals such as christmas and easter the royal apartments were divided into winter and summer rooms in order to regulate the temperature hot and cold water was used according to the season this circulated in the pipes of the hypocaust or the subterranean furnace which warmed the baths the rooms with chimneys were called epicaustoria stoves and it was the custom hermetically to close these when any one wished to be anointed with ointments and aromatic essences in the same manner as the gallo-roman houses the palaces of the frank kings and principal nobles of ecclesiastical or military order had therms or bathrooms to the therms were attached a columbum or wash-house a gymnasium for bodily exercise and a hypodrome or covered gallery for exercise which must not be confounded with the hippodrome a circus where horse races took place sometimes after the repast in the interval between two games of dice the nobles listened to a bard who sang the brilliant deeds of their ancestors in their native tongue under the government of charlemagne the private life of his subjects seems to have been less rough and coarse although they did not entirely give up their turbulent pleasures science and letters for a long time buried in monasteries reappeared like beautiful exiles at the imperial court and social life thereby gained a little charm and softness charlemagne had created in his palace under the direction of alcuin a sort of academy called the school of the palace which followed him everywhere the intellectual exercises of this school generally brought together all the members of the imperial family as well as all the persons of the household charlemagne in fact was himself one of the most attentive followers of the lessons given by alcuin he was indeed the principal interlocutor and discourser at the discussions which were on all subjects religious literary and philosophical charlemagne took as much pains with the administration of his palace as he did with that of his states in his capitulaire a work he wrote on legislature we find him descending to the minutest details in that respect for instance he not only interested himself in his warlike and hunting equipages but also in his kitchen and pleasure gardens he insisted upon knowing every year the number of his oxen horses and goats he calculated the produce of the sale of fruits gathered in his orchards which were not required for the use of his house he had a return on the number of fish caught in his ponds he pointed out the shrubs best calculated for ornamenting his garden and the vegetables which were required for his table etc the emperor generally assumed the greatest simplicity in his dress his daily attire consisted of a linen shirt and drawers and a woolen tunic fastened with a silk belt over this tunic he threw a cloak of blue stuff very long behind and before but very short on each side thus giving freedom to his arms to use his sword which he always wore on his feet he wore bands of stuffs of various colours crossed over one another and covering his legs also in winter when he travelled or hunted on horseback he threw over his shoulders a covering of otter or sheepskin the changes in fashion which the custom of the times necessitated but to which he would never submit personally induced him to issue several strenuous orders which however in reality had hardly any effect 
he was most simple in regards to his food and drink and made a habit of having pious or historical works read to him during his repasts he devoted the morning which with him began in summer at sunrise and in winter earlier to the political administration of his empire he dined at twelve with his family the dukes and chiefs of various nations first waited on him and then took their places at the table and were waited on in their turn by the counts prefects and superior officers of the court who dined after them when these had finished the different chiefs of the household sat down and they were succeeded lastly by the servants of the lower order who often did not dine till midnight and had to content themselves with what was left when occasion required however this powerful emperor knew how to maintain the pomp and dignity of his station but as soon as he had done what was necessary either for some great religious festival or otherwise he returned as if by instinct to his dear and native simplicity it must be understood that the simple tastes of charlemagne were not always shared by the princes and princesses of his family nor by the magnates of his court poets and historians have handed down to us descriptions of hunts feasts and ceremonies at which a truly asiatic splendour was displayed egenhardt however assures us that the sons and daughters of the king were brought up under their father's eye in liberal studios that to save them from the vice of idleness charlemagne required his sons to devote themselves to all bodily exercises such as horsemanship handling of arms etc and his daughters to do needlework and to spin from what is recorded however of the frivolous habits and irregular morals of these princesses it is evident that they but imperfectly realized the end of their education science and letters which for a time were brought into prominence by charlemagne and also by his son louis who was very learned and was considered skilful in translating and expounding scripture were however after the death of these two kings for a long time banished to the seclusion of the cloisters owing to the hostile rivalry of their successors which favoured the attacks of the norman pirates all the monuments and relics of the gallo-roman civilization which the great emperor had collected disappeared in the civil wars or were gradually destroyed by the devastations of the northerners the vast empire which charlemagne had formed became gradually split up so that from a dread of social destruction in order to protect churches and monasteries as well as castles and homesteads from the attacks of internal as well as foreign enemies towers and impregnable fortresses began to rise in all parts of europe and particularly in france during the first period of feudalism that is to say from the middle of the ninth to the middle of the twelfth centuries the inhabitants of castles had little time to devote to the pleasures of private life they had not only to be continually under arms for the endless quarrels of the king and the great chiefs but they had also to oppose the normans on the one side and the saracens on the other who being masters of the spanish peninsula spread like the rising tide in the southern counties of languedoc and provence it is true that the carlovingian warriors obtained a handsome and rich reward for these long and sanguinary efforts for at last they seized upon the provinces and districts which had originally been entrusted to their charge and the origin of their feudal possession was soon so far forgotten that their descendants pretended that they had held the lands which they had really usurped regardless of their oath from heaven and their swords it is needless to say that at the time the domestic life in these castles must have been dull and monotonous although according to m guizot the loneliness which was the result of this rough and laborious life became by degrees the pioneer of civilization when the owner of the fief left his castle his wife remained there though in a totally different position from that which women generally held she remained as mistress representing her husband and was charged with the defence and honour of the fief this high and exalted position in the centre of domestic life often gave to women an opportunity of displaying dignity courage virtue and intelligence which would otherwise have remained hidden 
and no doubt contributed greatly to their moral development and to the general improvement of their condition the importance of children and particularly of the eldest son was greater in feudal houses than elsewhere the eldest son of the noble was in the eyes of his father and of all his followers a prince and heir presumptive and the hope and glory of the dynasty these feelings and the domestic pride and affection of the various members one to another united to give families much energy and power add to this the influence of christian ideas and it will be understood how this lonely dull and hard castle life was nevertheless favourable to the development of domestic society and to that improvement in the condition of women which plays such a great part in the history of our civilization whatever opinion may be formed of chivalry it is impossible to deny the influence which this institution exercised on private life in the middle ages it considerably modified custom by bringing the stronger sex to respect and defend the weaker these warriors who were both simple and externally rough and coarse required association and intercourse with women to soften them in taking women and helpless widows under their protection they were necessarily more and more thrown in contact with them a deep feeling of veneration for women inspired by christianity and above all by the worship of the virgin mary ran throughout the songs of the troubadours and produced a sort of sentimental reverence for the gentle sex which culminated in the authority which women had in the courts of love End of section 5 Recording by Donna Stewart, Seattle, Washington